So the basic electron gun can be thought of as a tungsten, abbreviated W obviously, hairpin filament. So if we have a look at the diagram on the right here, the hairpin, tungsten filament, is this little bent piece of tungsten wire here. It's about 100 micron diameter. It's attached basically to a current via these electrodes here and it's uh, mounted inside a porcelain or insulating base. Tungsten hairpin filaments have been around for quite a long time. There's a look at one of them. It talks here about the Wainolt base with the grid cap removed. So there's a grid cap, a cap, you can see it here in the diagram, that sits over the top of this whole unit there and the tip of that hairpin filament is positioned just behind that, the hole in that Wainolt and that hole allows electrons to travel through. Those tungsten hairpin filaments are about $200 and they provide very stable electron beams. They provide quite a large diameter electron beam uh, usually and uh, they are found in, in most uh, baseline SEMs. So a couple of things to, to note here is that what we've represented here in this light blue and white is the uh, electrons being controlled and shaped and they're controlled and shaped here by the Wainolt. So the Wainolt sits over the top of the whole thing there and it has a negative voltage on it. That negative voltage basically repels the electrons and pushes them back to what we call a first crossover. And that's what we're representing here. This whole unit comprising the electron gun is designed to produce and fire electrons down through the column. And one of the reasons it can do that is just outside the Wainolt and that virtual source is produced, we have an anode. And that is uh, at 30, up, to, up to a maximum of 30,000 more negative than the anode and that is what accelerates the electrons down through the column. You'll see that it's got a hole in it and that uh, means it can act like a crude aperture or a filter for electrons that are off energy and off axis. So any electrons that aren't uh, centrally on axis, they encounter that anode and that anode is earthed and so those electrons are taken out of the equation so to speak. So this is the first of the unannotated diagrams I talked about and you have the opportunity there to look at this diagram and annotate whatever you want to take out of that you can just to reprise we've basically got a current that runs through there to generate electrons we boil electrons off just like an incandescent bulb they shower out in all directions there's a small bias that's a negative voltage in this case that controls and shapes that um, those electrons into our crossover or virtual source and here we've got the anode represented here in cross section or transverse section and we've got the electron beam traveling down through the center of that and any electrons that are off axis off energy that encounter that anode are right up at the start of this whole system being taken out of the equation worth having a look at different filament types there's our tungsten hairpin filament as i said it's a bent piece of tungsten wire why do we use tungsten it uh, it tolerates heat very well it, uh, it boils off electrons very, very readily and it's, it's very durable. So um, it gets up to about 2,300 degrees centigrade. The next type of filament that is commonly used in scanning electron microscopes is the lanthanum hexaboride, sometimes a cerium hexaboride. Lanthanum hexaboride is a crystalline material. It's usually purple in color. I'll show you an example in a diagram soon. And then what we could regard as the ultimate in terms of resolution um, are field emission guns and they are very very fine chemically etched tungsten crystals uh, extremely fine down to nanometers so the smaller you can make that tip the smaller you can make the electron probe we regard these lanthanum hexaboride field emission guns as high brightness sources and what we mean by that is that we can produce um, a very very small probe with a lot of electrons in it and if we can put a lot of electrons in a small probe it means we can get a lot of signal back if we do it graphically and we produce here the number of electrons, that is the signal, and down here we have the electron probe diameter, we'll see that it's a linear relationship. And what uh, your diagram in your theory doesn't have is a representation of the diameter of the probe. So if we add those two things there, what that really shows us graphically is we can have a very, very large probe and have a lot of signal but if we have a very small probe for a particular filament type, we have a lot less signal. And this is where tungsten filaments uh, kind of fall over a little bit. If you want to make, and you need to make sometimes for high magnification, 
the probe diameter very small to interrogate your sample, you are simply not going to get enough signal back to be able to get a nice strong looking image. Field emission guns, lanthanum hexaboride crystals, they actually have a lot more electrons in a finer probe to start with, so we can basically get enough signal. There are some differences between these uh, three types of, of filament. Certainly how long they last um, is a big difference. Tungsten hairpin filaments might last you 100 hours. Lanthanum hexaboride might last you, in an operational sense, six months to a year. Field emission might last you five or even ten years. So we've already talked about the fact that we produce a very, very large probe quite readily with a tungsten hairpin filament and we can progressively produce finer and finer probes with these, uh, these, these two high brightness sources. Of course, there's a big difference in cost and that's the main thing. Uh, as I said, $200 for a tungsten hairpin might only last 100 hours. Field emission, $20,000 that might last you five or 10 years and provide you all that resolution. There's also another requirement that really contributes um, to this high cost, and that is the fact that you have to produce, uh, have to have uh, produced a very, very high quality vacuum for these high brightness filaments. So this is a look at an old, on the right, and a new lanthanum hexaboride filament. Over time, the filament erodes away, all the filaments eventually uh, erode away, and you can see that uh, this lanthanum hexaboride crystal has receded right back, amazingly, even though it's nearly gone, it still has a, a little tip there, so it still would be providing quite a lot of resolution. But when it's eroded that far, we're really not getting very much signal and it's time to replace it. Putting some numbers on some of these things we've talked about. The diameter of the electron source, uh, 30,000 nanometers for a tungsten hairpin. Looking at the two different main types of field emission, cold field emission and Schottky hot field emission. We've got you know, 5 and, and 20 nanometers diameter of the electron source. That's that virtual source right at the top. Brightness is measured in stir radians, and you can see we've got a much, much higher, brighter source, orders of magnitude more for these field emission compared to the tungsten. And this is what I mentioned before about the quality of vacuum. So for a standard tungsten hairpin filament machine, we need a vacuum in tor, which is a unit of vacuum, about 10 to the minus 4 tor. But for a field emission, we need very, very high vacuum up in the order of 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 tor. That's, that's better than deep space vacuum. The final thing we can say here is that uh, we can term these tungsten and lanthanum hexaboride crystals as being thermionic or thermal emitters. That is, they run hot. Similarly, the Schottky field emission runs at 1400 degrees uh, centigrade, but the cold field emission runs at room temperature, provides very, very high resolution. We have examples of these machines uh, in CMM. Here are some more contemporary types of tungsten filaments. This is a K-style filament with a bent piece of 100 micron diameter tungsten wire attached between two electrodes supplying current. That current is what heats up the filament so it can boil off the electrons. These filaments are mounted in this component here, part of the electron gun. That is where the filament would be. Over the top of that is a Wainolt. Wainolt has a very, very small hole in the center. It sits over the top of the filament and that whole assembly is right at the top of the column. And if you include the anode below that, you've got the whole electron gun used to fire electrons down through the column. Having a look at a different Wainolt from, uh, from a different SEM, we can see it has a larger hole in the center and this Wainolt assembly would be positioned at the top of the column. Inside a plastic case here, I have a different type of filament. This is the lanthanum hexaboride filament. It would be positioned like this. It comprises two electrodes and at the very, very top of that little central turret there is a purple crystal, lanthanum hexaboride crystal a high brightness filament. Unfortunately, I don't have a field emission filament to show you, as it's fairly rare to get hold of those. But to start looking at a scanning electron microscope in terms of optics, it's worth coming back to a transmission electron microscope. They are more analogous to a compound light microscope in that we pass light through thin samples and we stain those thin samples to provide contrast. In the case of TEM biological samples, we make them about 70 nanometers thick by sectioning them. We can stain them with heavy metals such as osmium, urinal acetate, and uh, the like. And comparing the optics of a standard compound light microscope to a TEM, we start to 
to get an idea of, of some of the arrangements here. There's an illumination source. There's a condenser lens which condenses the light from that. We then have our specimen positioned at the particular crossover here and then below that we have an objective lens there and we condense that image again there and eventually we look at from the projection lens basically an image of the specimen. As Rick is doing over here we're looking with a TEM at an image on a fluorescent screen. If we look at the scanning electron microscope it's more analogous to a dissector light microscope in that it looks at the surface of the sample. I put surface in uh, abbreviations there because uh, we're not really strictly looking just at the surface and we'll talk about that in more detail later but we're definitely not looking right through the sample. Our sample can be regarded as bulk or infinitely thick and the contrast that we're getting back is not uh, due to staining it's due to the number and types of electrons that leave the sample during the scanning process. A little more elaborate diagram here from my scope light microscope optics so here we are source of illumination condenser lens objective lens and projection lens you'll see that the SEM is a little different we have a source of illumination we have our anode of course and our condenser lens and here we have an aperture now an aperture basically is a card with small holes in it an aperture strip we can call it a piece of metal uh, usually chrome a molly or a platinum we can into the path of those electrons we can introduce that strip with different diameter holes and we can take away electrons from the outside of it to a greater or lesser extent allowing more or less electrons to pass through to the next lens which is the objective lens or focusing lens and it is here that we do the final focus produce a very very fine probe of electrons on our sample surface of course we have to detect the signals that are coming back from that if we're going to generate any sort of image and therefore we have a secondary electron detector located there. I think we'll have a little bit of a look at uh, the aperture in more detail and discuss a little bit about uh, gun alignment. So over here I have an aperture that has been removed from an SEM. It has a course adjustment to allow you to position different apertures under the beam and some fine adjustments here for the X and the Y. On the very tip up here we have little tangs that hold an aperture strip which is a little piece of metal, molly or platinum and that strip gets inserted under those final tangs there and that's what gets moved under the path of the beam. We call this whole assembly an objective aperture by virtue of where it's positioned in relation to the objective lens. So we've talked about filaments, we've talked about the electron, electron optic system, we need to align the electron optic system and we generally start at the top aligning the filament. Really what we're trying to do is to make sure that we have our illumination shining centrally down through the column giving us as, as much signal as we possibly can have on our specimen. And it can be thought of very simplistically as just a tube with a torch on top and as I put that torch there you can see my illumination is going right down through the center. Because the energy is regularly changed anywhere between 0 and 30,000 volts it's important that we are able to readjust the position of that filament to make sure it's always shining down through the center. There's two main components that are required for gun alignment. There is a component called the gun tilt. Gun tilt is simply tilting that direction, we can call that the X direction, you can see we're losing signal as we get off axis, X direction and Y direction. So if you adjust the tilt, X and Y, you can maximize the illumination and center the beam. The other component that's important to adjust is the gun shift and that can be X and Y. you'll see those adjustments on many machines and you can do them manually or do that whole process automatically. If we do an operational overview of an SEM we can uh, represent it in this way. We know that there's a cloud of electrons formed at the filament tip and they're accelerated down through that column by that high voltage on the anode and we know that that anode also acts as a crude aperture in that it has a hole in it that takes electrons um, that are off energy, off axis, away and leaves a more cohesive beam of electrons. The way this diagram has been drawn 
is accurate to the extent that the electron beam diverges, it spreads out over distance. And what we do with these electromagnets, which are represented here in cross-section by these uh, square rectangles, is we converge that, um, that diverging beam again. And we do that basically twice with those electromagnetic lenses. And what we are doing is producing a very, very fine probe on our specimen, and it is that probe that is being scanned across our, our, our specimen to produce our image. Yet another look, an electron gun, our first aperture, our anode, our condenser lenses. Sometimes there are a number of magnetic lenses. They function as one. We have an aperture here, and for the first time we're seeing these things called deflection coils. And deflection coils basically uh, deflect the electron beam across that, that rastering pattern. The objective lens there is what we use for our final focus. And we have here for the first time representation of stigmata coils. Stigmata coils are part of the focusing that is required to get a good uh, sharp image. And uh, what they do is they make the electron beam round. Of course we have detectors and we have our sample which is positioned on our stage. And as that last point is, uh, is illustrating there, we have the whole column under vacuum. So sometimes it's more convenient to just represent the electron beam as a single line rather than draw it as, uh, as a diverging cone. If we go in a little further and have a look at uh, an actual diagram of an SEM, we can start to see more accurately where these, um, these particular components are placed. This one's from the University of, of Tennessee Department of Material Science and Engineering. And you'll also see that there's a little bit of uh, differing terminology for, for some of these components, but we'll try to, uh, to standardise as much as we possibly can. But I make no apologies for the fact that we, we do have to refer to uh, some of these um, particular things the way they are talked about in the vernacular, that is generally. There might be uh, some duplication. Electron gun up here comprises the anode and the Wainault as we know. The alignment coils, that's a new feature. The alignment coils uh, align the electron beam. And uh, they're electromagnets and basically what they are doing is ensuring that that electron beam is, is is pointed uh, directly down through the center of the column and not being blocked in any way and therefore giving us the highest resolution image with the most signal. If we have a look here, we've got condenser lens one, condenser lens two, we'll call that condenser lens. We have to understand what a condenser lens exactly does and we'll go into those in a bit more detail later. We've talked about a variable aperture uh, already. That's that strip uh, of metal that, uh, that can be adjusted uh, to be a larger or a smaller hole to shave off um, respectively uh, less electrons or more electrons. Down here the stigmata coils which make that beam round and that is very important as we'll see later to have the beam round otherwise we get artifacts and a less high quality resolution image. And deflection coils, they're the scan coils that we talked about deflecting that beam allowing it to do that rastering pattern. And uh, right down the bottom here we have our condenser lens 3 on this diagram, which we can think of and should think of as the objective lens, and that is our focus lens. A couple of other things here which are interesting, shows the vacuum down here at the bottom of the chamber. That is where a lot of the vacuum components are positioned, but there is always a connection of vacuum back up here to the gun where we require a very, very high quality vacuum. So there will always be a link. And this stage is represented as being a, a mechanical stage. There's uh, different controls for moving the specimen up and down, around and around, uh, and allowing the scanning to stay in one place while the specimen is basically being moved to the region we are interested in. One of the components of focus is astigmatism correction. And we've got on this diagram the position of the stigmators. It's worth having a little bit of a look at, at some actual stigmators and discussing how they work. It's positioned like this and the beam runs centrally down through that hole. The role of astigmatism correction is to make the beam round. If the beam is oval, we have artifacts introduced into our imaging. Around this beam are positioned, in this case, eight little electromagnets and we control all eight of those electromagnets using two controls, again an X and a Y. And we adjust the X and we adjust the Y following certain procedures 
and that allows us to control and shape the beam and make sure it is in fact round. So there's a little bit of detail on some of these terms that we've been talking about there. I won't go through these in any detail. You can read them yourself, but it is worth having a bit of a look at the very last one there, the electron lenses. It says that electron lenses can reduce the diameter of the electron source down to a beam of about 10 nanometers spot size. So most SEMs are able to, uh, to generate a beam of that diameter and still able to give us enough current to produce an acceptable image. It's worth also noting that optimal resolution or even resolution about 10 nanometers may not be possible on certain uh, specimens depending on the nature of those specimens. So uh, very, very sample dependent your ultimate resolution that you are able to achieve uh, with the scanning electron microscope. We have yet another unannotated diagram, so if you refer to, to those, uh, you can fill in the details that you're interested in from this, uh, this PowerPoint. I'll very, very briefly reiterate a few things. This is our electron gun at the top there, comprising our filament and grid cap, or Wainold as we call it, uh, and our anode. So that's our electron gun up there, firing electrons down through the column. Our first lens encountered from the top down is the condenser lens. And it says here that that actually controls the spot size. So it has an effect on the diameter of the probe that we are using to interrogate the sample right down here. An aperture, we've already talked about in some detail. And here our objective lens basically is used to control focus. A very important point to recognize is that a specimen in an SEM can be perfectly in focus but still not sharp in terms of image quality. If we have too large a probe, even if it's a focus probe, we can still have a blurry image. We talked about that right at the very beginning. So it's worth considering that focus in an SEM is quite a specific thing. Focus in an SEM is the crossover on the sample surface. That is controlled by the objective lens. I have a bit of a look at scanning image generation. We've got a diagram here which we're fairly familiar with already should be able to recognize most, most of those features there. But you can see, perhaps here for the first time, the deflection coils deflect the beam. They bump the beam and they position that beam uh, at a particular point for our, for our scanning raster pattern. And here, as we've already covered before, is our image being built up point by point, line by line. So the deflection coils have a job to raster that beam over the sample surface at the same time as an equivalent screen scan is being produced. Deflection coils are small electromagnets that deflect the beam over the raster pattern on our sample. We talked before about the beam being positioned at each of the pixel points. We can think of the beam in this way. It is deflected by the electromagnets to the edge of the scan and to, through the center to the other edge of the scan. At low magnification, that distance is quite large. That means that the length of the beam in the center versus the length of the beam at the extremities of that low magnification scan are quite different. And that can introduce sine theta errors and some distortion at low magnifications, perhaps less than 500 times. At high magnification, as you know, we are only scanning a small area. And if we're scanning a small area of the scan, the length of the beam in the center and the length of the beam at the edge are pretty much the same. And we don't have that distortion of the edges of the image. The other consideration is that at low magnification, where the beam is doing a wide sweep, can lead to overheating of the scan coils. So when we leave our machines in an idling state at the end of our session, or when we're not using the, the SEM for any length of time, is we leave it at a high magnification to avoid that overheating problem. If we look at electron detectors, we've mentioned here secondary electrons give us topographical information or shape information. Secondary electrons come from inelastic collisions. They provide a spatial resolution down to less than 5 nanometers. On certain SEMs, high quality SEMs, it can be down to 1.5 or even less nanometers. Very, very high resolution, good quality spatial shape imaging. Backscattered electrons are produced by elastic collisions of the electron with the sample uh, atoms and produce compositional information 
with a spatial resolution of hundreds of nanometers. And the reason that their spatial resolution is nowhere near as good as secondary electrons is that those backscattered electrons are collected from a greater depth. Secondary electrons are low energy, slow electrons collected from the top 10, 15 nanometers. Backscattered electrons, they have enough energy to come from a greater depth, hundreds of nanometers. And as a result of that, their spatial resolution is worse. But they provide us very useful compositional information. If there's no topography, all the contrast that we get from a backscattered electron image is to do with compositional differences. What I mean by that is if you polish a sample flat and remove all the shape, then whatever contrast you're getting is due to the different densities of the material that's in that sample, on that sample surface. We can also collect x-rays and we can produce uh, maps of, of those and spectra. The Everhart Thornley detector is generally regarded as a secondary electron detector. It was designed by two gentlemen, Everhart and Thornley, back in the 1960s, and they're used extensively today in SEMs. This part on the right here shows some of the components and features of the Everhart or ET detector, Everhart Thornley detector. On the outside of the detector, there is a collector cage which has a bias, and sometimes, but not always, you can adjust that bias. If you have a positive voltage on that bias, you attract negatively charged secondary electrons towards it. You only need a low voltage on that collector case to attract the low voltage secondary electrons towards it. So you literally suck those secondary electrons that are generated towards that detector. Once they have been attracted, they basically encounter a scintillator here on the front. And once they um, go into that, they are uh, exposed to a very, very high kilovoltage, up to nine or 10,000 kilovolts, given high energy. And they're basically converted by the scintillator into light. That light is then passed through a quartz light path through the wall of the SEM chamber and out to the electronics of the Everhart Thornley um, detector. The second type of electron detector that we look at in detail here is the backscatter detector, which is a solid state silicon diode type of detector. And it's positioned above the sample. The Everhard Thornley detector is positioned off to the side. You've probably recollected from previous diagrams that it's been that case. And the reason for that is by angling that detector, we enhance the production of, of topography and, and shape. So we get shadowing as a result of positioning that detector to the side. We see um, things that are closer to that detector as brighter and things that are further away or hidden by the features of the sam sample uh, as being darker. And that produces a very, very natural lifelike image. Backscattered electron detectors are positioned um, above the sample there and produce a more uniform illumination. So let's have a look at some actual electron detectors. The first detector that we have here is an Everhart Thornley secondary electron detector. It is positioned off to the side of the specimen, often at a slight angle, to enhance shadowing and topography. Some of the components include the collector at the end here, biased grid. There's a small voltage on it, usually up to about 300 volts positive, to attract secondary electrons towards it. This component here sits inside the vacuum of the column, and the other components are outside. Inside here, we have our quartz light path and photomultiplier. The second type of detector we have here is a backscatter detector. It's a silicon diode type of detector, has a hole in the center through which the beam passes, and it's positioned above the specimen in the path of the beam so that high energy backscatter can be collected from above. This particular detector has two parts, an A and a B part. It's divided into two. And we can add or subtract signals from those two parts. Going further with this secondary electron detector position, this image is from a secondary electron detector and you can see where it was positioned because it is brightest. The electrons closest to that detector being detected more readily and those further away we are being lost, basically blocked and it looks, um, it looks like it's been lit from a light from the particular side and position of that secondary electron detector. Here's another image and uh, if you're wanting to know where that secondary electron detector is positioned you look for the, the bright region there down this bottom and that is where it was positioned. Part of the reason for uh, this type of, of image 
this lifelike image that we're producing, uh, is to do with the fact that electrons like edges and peaks. That's where they tend to, uh, to congregate, that's where they tend to be generated. Looking in a little more detail, and I won't spend long on this, at the Everhart Thornley Secondary Electron Detector, basically what we have here at the end is a scintillator. This is um, a light path here, and this is the electronics I was talking about. And basically what we are getting in, in here is, is amplification, basically, with, with um, a photomultiplier, taking a small amount of signal and increasing the gain enormously so that we end up with a lot of, of, of signal. So we're amplifying that signal. We introduce photons and basically we produce an output pulse of electrons with a gain of 10, up to 10 to the 5, 10 to the minus 6. Backscatter detectors are usually comprised of a silicon diode or a wafer which has a hole in the middle and can be divided into sectors, either two or four or sometimes no sectors. If there's no sectors, basically what we've produced is a backscatter comp detector that uh, only gets used for backscatter compositional signal and not topography. But if we have two different sectors, we can produce that topographical backscattered image that I showed you previously. Of course, the beam travels down through the center uh, of that diode, which is positioned just above the sample. It's easily broken. It's one of the things we worry about. They are expensive, uh, and really we have to take quite a lot of care not to, not to run the sample into them. If you add the signal from the A component, to the B component, you get our standard compositional signal. If you subtract the signal from the B side away from the A side, you lose all the compositional information and you get a topographical image showing you shape. And as I've reiterated there, it is positioned just above the sample and it is expensive uh, if broken. So we, we are always worried about um, breaking the backscatter detector. And, uh, and there's certainly information in all your machine instructions as to how to avoid uh, doing that. Here is another look at how we produce those um, compositional and topo modes using the two different components. Um, basically, we are um, adding a signal here, and here we are um, basically subtracting signal and, uh, and removing the compositional differences. So there's a number of components that supply our scanning electron microscopes. And one of those is a water chilling system. It's worth being aware of. It may impact on you in your, your uh, use. And I put this image in here, uh, it's of one of our rooms in our Hawken lab, uh, L106, and that beautiful um, purple flooring there is in fact about uh, a centimetre of water coloured with, with purple um, algaecide that has flooded out of a plumbing leak and covered the whole floor. Situations like this um, are potentially quite dangerous with electricity and these are some of the sorts of things we need to be aware of and we risk assess for. All plumbing leaks, it, uh, it is unavoidable uh, that there will be some sort of leaking. And if you notice that, you need to inform CMM staff. Why do we have water coming in? It's used to cool some of the SEM diffusion pumps, which are a component of the vacuum, and some of those lenses, the objective lens in particular, gets quite hot. So we, we have chilled water running through the laboratory, running through to each of the SEMs. Some other SEM components, anti-contaminators. On the side of um, SEMs, they have a, a dewer that holds liquid nitrogen and basically it's connected to inside the evacuated column and it allows a very, very cold point to be produced inside that will trap and hold any gas that's coming out of the sample, therefore uh, reduce contamination and reduce detriment to the image caused by that, uh, that outgassing of the sample. Also feeding our SEMs, there uh, is compressed air or compressed uh, nitrogen gas. And we use that for venting our sample chamber. And again, um, those have to be supplied and, uh, and they can leak sometimes. So if you are hearing uh, leaking of gas, that's certainly worth telling staff about because there there'll be a problem there. So here on the 7100, we have the anti-contaminator, Dua, that gets filled with liquid nitrogen cools a copper braid that goes in to a cold point inside the column. It's not always used, but it's there if it's needed. Nitrogen gas on the wall there with a regulator and a black tube attached to it running at a selected pressure. To the right of that, we can see our water supply coming in and our water supply is again set at a particular flow rate. These things are not under operator control. They are looked after by CMM staff and service engineers. So we're going to talk a little bit now about specimen beam interactions. 
that is the signals generated as a result of the primary electron beam encountering the samples. We're mainly focusing on secondary electrons and backscattered electrons. But you can see that we also generate x-rays, we can also generate an OJ electrons from the sample surface. We can collect light using a special cathodoluminescence detector and we can measure the specimen current. Our main focus, however, is secondary and backscattered electrons and we know that they give us topography and compositional information respectively but we also need to be aware that we can generate and collect x-rays. We call collection and analysis of x-rays microanalysis. Secondary electrons generate as a result of inelastic scattering and they provide characteristic x-rays and other interactions. Elastic scattering is the mechanism by which backscattered electrons are produced. And these diagrams illustrate the way secondary electrons are produced. Key here is that secondary electrons are produced from the ionization of inner shell electrons and those electrons from the electron cloud are those that we collect with our secondary electron detector. So the primary beam comes in, it's enough energy to dislodge those electrons from the valence shells and those are what we collect uh, and call secondary electrons. Backscattered electrons are primary beam electrons that have interacted with the nucleus of the material atoms and come back to the detector which is positioned above the sample. So they're not secondarily generated electrons, they're actually primary beam high energy electrons that um, are collected. Some of them pass right through and aren't collected but, um, but those that are contribute to our backscattered signal primary electron beam is generating signals below the sample surface. Remember we talked about our sample as being infinitely thick. The diagram on the right is probably the more representative of most situations and what you can see here is that we're generating secondary electrons from the primary beam in this region here. But we're also generating backscattered electrons that have enough energy from a greater depth, about 40 percent of this whole interaction volume we've represented here, to get back through the sample, out of the sample surface and back to a detector. And x-rays which come from the whole of that interaction volume have enough energy to do likewise to make it back to uh, come out of the sample surface and be, be collected. So this ties in with our notion we've covered already that secondary electrons are from the very very surface, the top 10 or 15 nanometers. They are generated through the whole interaction volume, which is this volume here, but they don't have enough energy to be able to get out of the sample and be collected. Originally, this interaction volume was called a teardrop interaction volume because it was uh, demonstrated using methacrylate resin uh, and had a teardrop shape, but uh, as I said, this diagram here is more representative. So a very important um, component of, uh, of that is to do with the generation of SE1s and SE2s and I'm going to go to the board uh, and just um, illustrate this in some detail. We can represent our sample surface like this. We can re uh, represent our electron beam like this and we'll actually give it a little bit of diameter here. Here we go, that's our electron beam has a diameter, that's our probe diameter down there, our spot. And we generate signal from this interaction volume. The interaction volume, the depth from which we can generate x-rays, 100% of that volume, is in the order, depending on the sample, of 2 to 3 microns. But the diameter of that probe can be down to 2 to 5 nanometers on a high resolution SEM. We know we can generate from about 40% of that volume backscattered electrons. And they have enough energy to exit the sample surface from that particular depth. Those secondary electrons generated here, the diameter of the probe, we call those SE1s. And they provide us with the highest potential resolution image because they are down to the diameter of the probe. The problem with backscatter is that backscatter is high energy. And backscatter electrons generated from the sample have enough energy from this step, 40% of this volume, to come back to the sample surface and to generate secondary electrons.
and call those backscattered generated secondary electrons SE2s. And what they do is reduce the ability of the SEM to resolve fine detail because they make the effective spot this diameter here rather than this diameter here. So backscattered electrons, while they're wonderful in their own right, producing compositional information, they reduce our ability to obtain high resolution SE images. Continuing on with specimen beam interactions, enhanced admission with edge effect as we call it, is a result of secondary electron emission being the highest on peaks, edges and circumferences. These regions emit electrons more efficiently so they appear brighter. There's also a tilt effect. Secondary electron emission from a surface depends on the probe incident angle. If you've got a sloping surface, then the zone of secondary electron emission is greater. You can see that. When you've tilted here, the interaction volume is producing a larger area on that slope surface than it will on a flat surface there. A large slope embiggens the secondary electron emission zone. Samples that have ups and downs generate quite a lot of signal as a result of these, uh, these tilting effects. Worth noting that a low accelerating voltage gives less penetration and thus reduces bright edge portions, means surface microstructures can be more easily seen. Low accelerating voltage basically allows you to see more surface detail because those fine features on the surface aren't being masked by the signal produced by backscattered electrons and a large interaction volume. The accelerating voltage basically influences the size of the interaction volume. As the accelerating voltage increases, the interaction volume increases. And we know that the inter interaction volume increasing means that we reduce our ability to see fine surface features because of those SE2s. And here you can see, same specimen, different KVs. Lower KV produces a smaller interaction volume and therefore is not masking those surface features. The other effect is the density of the sample. As the density of the sample decreases, the beam interaction volume increases. What does that mean? We can see here, same accelerating voltage, 10 kV, 10 kilovolts, on a sample comprised of gold, keeps it very, very small, steel, larger interaction action volume, and something that's not particularly dense, such as a polymer, produces a large interaction volume. Magnetic lenses comprised of a copper wire coiled around a soft iron core and a current is passed through that copper wire. And we use these to, to guide and concentrate electrons. They work analogously to glass lenses in a light microscope. And for the first time here we're considering the fact that the electron beam is actually spiralling. And it spirals as a result of, of Fleming's uh, right hand rule. And an interesting thing to consider when we're using these types of electromagnetic lenses, we're controlling the strength of that lens by controlling the amount of current that flows through them with a knob or a software control. And as we put more current through that lens, that lens actually works better. And the SEM uh, works more efficiently and we have less effects on our imaging um, as a result of that. So if you can run an electromagnetic lens with a high current through it, then it's going to work better basically than a low current and we need to consider that in the design of the SEM. You can see that spiraling effect as you adjust the accelerating voltage or the working distance. The working distance moving the specimen up and down and you can see that the specimen will rotate basically as you pick up the raster at a different point of that, that spiral. So we have an electromagnetic lens uh, removed from a machine that we can have a bit of a look at. At the right angle we can see the hole down through the center and this is positioned in the column. We use these electromagnetic lenses by virtue of the current passed through these wires here to control and shape the electron beam. We're having a bit of a look here at uh, the electron gun and uh, what we do to saturate that electron gun. What we mean by saturating an electron gun is putting uh, sufficient current through that uh, filament to generate an adequate signal but without driving it so hard that we shorten the life of the filament. And what we typically see with a tungsten hairpin filament is an increase in brightness as we increase the filament current up to a peak and then as we increase that filament current 
further, we get a decrease in the amount of signal, and then it rises again. It may do this one or two times. Rises again, and there's very little increase beyond that for an increase in filament current. In other words, if we continue pushing higher filament current through, we don't get any more signal uh, from the, the filament, we don't get any more signal back uh, from the specimen, and we shorten the life of our filament and we blow the filament. We tend to saturate here, where it's giving us that maximum amount of emission, adequate emission, and leave it at the minimum there where it's stable, uh, it's, it's on, the, on the plateau if you like, and, uh, and, and we're, we're preserving filament life. If you get a chance to do this, you may see just a general increase in signal, that is a, a, a better looking image, brighter image, uh, or you may have a graphical uh, representation of the saturation. Uh, it will vary from machine to machine. And that is a typical saturation curve. We call these little false peaks or knees where the signal starts to decrease before it rises again. When we are saturated, we've got a constant flow of electrons into the column for proper operation. And we get to this point where there, no further increase in filament current will increase the beam current. So the beam current is the current that's actually in the beam. The filament is the current that's passing through that filament to actually generate those electrons. If we push that too hard, uh, we increase um, it to the point where the filament will break. And of course, that will, will cost us money. At this point, we're going to have a look at the vacuum system, in particular, the, the components um, of a typical SEM and some of the, um, the gauges and, and the like that, uh, that support that. What we're trying to achieve with the vacuum is to make sure that we have a high mean free path for the electrons down through, through the column. We don't want any scattering as a result of, of atoms, molecules uh, in, in, the, uh, in the path of the electron beam. And we can provide a suitable SEM vacuum from a component called a diffusion pump, abbreviated DP, or a turbomolecular pump, abbreviated TMP, that is backed by a rotary pump. So in the background, and I can hear it now, there's a rotary pump that's backing on our machine in this room, a turbomolecular pump, but it could just as equally be a diffusion pump. So those two vacuum devices provide an adequate vacuum for, for routine or even above routine scanning electron microscopy. Better vacuum costs money. Often represented on the SEM is a vacuum schematic. It shows a number of the different components we've already talked about and how in operation they work. We've got the SEM column here, the SEM chamber, and we are pumping that chamber with a vacuum system. That vacuum system comprises a diffusion pump here backed by a rotary pump. At the moment, the diffusion pump is on and the rotary pump is backing that diffusion pump and it is pumping the chamber. If we vented that chamber, perhaps to load a specimen, what would happen is the diffusion pump would be blocked off and the rotary pump would be directly pumping the specimen chamber. When a sufficiently good quality vacuum is reached, that line there will be closed as it is in this diagram and this will be open. And that is the state that we basically operate routinely with the SEMs when we're imaging and certainly the way we leave our SEMs uh, when we, we shut them down to an idle state. Vacuum values vary enormously. The units I prefer to use and have used so far are TOR. There's 133 pascals in a TOR. Millibars are a common uh, unit as well. And uh, there's 0.75 TOR in each millibar. Don't worry too much about the vacuum units. If there's a particular value that has to be obtained, uh, then that will be noted in your machine instructions. If there's a gauge that has to be looked at, then the gauge will, will illustrate um, by virtue of a mark where you have to get up to. While I prefer to work in TOR, a lot of the gauges uh, on SEMs and ancillary components like coders may be in other units. You can convert them. A rotary pump, a roughing pump, abbreviated RP, can pump from atmospheric pressure through to about 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 TOR. That is the baseline pump that we use. The next level of vacuum, and it's a hierarchical level uh, uh, system here, is a diffusion pump or a turbomolecular pump. Diffusion pump can get you to about 10 to the minus 5 TOR, and if you have a diffusion pump that uh, can have liquid nitrogen added, you can probably achieve 10 to the minus 6 TOR. The liquid nitrogen cools components in that diffusion pump and, uh, and traps and holds gases and uh, improves the quality of the vacuum. We'll have a look at how the hot oil diffusion pump works. It's very interesting, I think, and how the turbomolecular pump works in some detail. 
The next level of vacuum is iron getter pumps, IGP, and they take you up to 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 11 tor. You'll find those on our high resolution machines, those that are equipped with field emission guns where we need very, very high vacuum. So a rotary pump works by positive displacement of gas. That's fluid flow. So it pumps basically um, air like it, a water pump pumps. And here we have uh, a section through the middle of, of a fairly old style uh, rotary pump. And when they're functioning, they chug. You can hear them in the background. It has an electric motor which drives a concentric piston. Basically, it, it sucks in through the input, compresses that, uh, that gas and forces it out through the exhaust. So they're running continuously. They um, have a little bit of oil in them down the bottom there, small amount, and these days the whole unit is, is combined so that we have the electric motor and the pump all as one unit. If they are making an, an atypical noise, uh, then either they're working hard because you've just evacuated the chamber uh, or there's something wrong and there's a leak in the system uh, in which case you need to do something about that or you'll heat the, the, um, the pump up and it will, it will stop working. So we can have a look at one of our roughing pumps that we've cut a section away from. This component would normally fit on there and this is the drive belt driven by a motor that turns, rotates and basically we're driving a piston around compressing um, that gas inside and exhausting it, it out with this rotary pump. It sits there running continuously as the SEM is under vacuum. We have to change the oil on them regularly, monitor the level of those, but by and large they sit there doing their job very effectively. Diffusion pumps work in a different way. It's, it's a Momentum transfer of gas, uh, a molecular flow. It's a random process and very interesting sort of system. We'll have a look at a real one uh, in a little while. But if we take a section through the middle, we can see we've got at the top a throat. It's just a great big valve and that's basically through which it pumps. And down the bottom, it's got a heater which heats a reservoir of special oil which produces vapour which shoots up this, this chimney and fires out through these veins at jet speed. Around the outside of that are cooling coils through which that, that uh, cooling water, chiller water, is pumped to keep that whole system cool. And down the bottom here is a connection for the mechanical pump or the rotary pump or roughing pump. You don't use a diffusion pump until you've achieved a roughing pump vacuum and then you open the throat. If you, if you put uh, uh, a diffusion pump on, to pump atmosphere, it will crack all the oil and produce carbon and all sorts of problems with it. So it sits there waiting until it's at a sufficiently good vacuum to be used. So the vapour shoots out those veins at 300 to 400 metres per second. Any air molecules that is, are encountered by that um, jet are basically knocked downstream, knocked back down towards the bottom there. And any of the vapour that encounters the side there is condensed by that cooled surface and so the whole thing, thing has no working parts, it just sits there basically um, heating with no mechanical movement there at all. So uh, they're a cheap, reliably um, used uh, unit. The only issue with those is the fact that there's an oil component and that oil by virtue of backstream can get into the, uh, into the chamber to a small extent and contaminate our sample. So let's have a look at an actual diffusion pump. Here is effectively a complete assembly. This is the way it sits at the bottom of the SEM chamber. There is a valve, a butterfly valve that opens to allow that to begin pumping. A rotary pump would be connected to this here and be backing that. There is an oil reservoir down here and a heater that heats that oil. There is cooling coils around the outside through which chilled water passes to keep that under control in terms of temperature. And inside, there is a chimney. We can have a look at a chimney I've removed from a diffusion pump, and you can see how it's constructed. So that's the way it sits inside. Oil vapour passes up through the centre and shoots out of these veins at high speed. And anything that it encounters there will be whacked back to the edges. This device can get you to a very good vacuum if you have a diffusion pump that has one of these devices or something like this 
it can be cooled with liquid nitrogen to improve the efficiency in the short term of that pump and improve the vacuum. So in preference to a diffusion pump, particularly these days, we use a thing called a turbo molecular pump, which in effect is like a jet engine. It has rotating vanes, stator uh, blades and turbine blades. Basically, it pumps from the top here. These spin at 20,000 RPM or thereabouts, very, very high speed. It's also backed by a diffusion pump. The good thing about that is there's no oil in that system, so there's less chance of contamination in the SEM. Another interesting feature is certain of them have the ability to be basically frictionless. So once they start rotating above a certain speed, they levitate and there's a magnetic bearing, which, which means that they just spin uh, without producing any heat. The gas molecules are given momentum by repeated collision with a moving solid. So those veins whack the, the molecules that are, that are inside the, the chamber and, and drive them towards the exhaust. So a simple process, expensive, they are you know, anywhere between $8,000 and $50,000 for routine SEM ones. So here you can see the size. This is a relatively small turbo molecular pump for a scanning electron microscope. It sits in this position and replaces the diffusion pump, backed by a roughing pump by this outlet here. And if we turn it over, we can see the veins, the stator blades and the, and the veins, rotating veins that make contact with any molecules that it encounters. So they spin at high speed, sit there doing their job until usually the bearings fail and they start to make a noise, in which case we replace them. So at the top of the hierarchy of the vacuum system that we typically use for an SEM is a thing called an iron getter pump. And they work in a different way. They trap and hold gas. What they basically do is they operate via ionization of gases. They trap that gas inside the unit. Again, we don't operate those until the vacuum is at a very, very good level. Otherwise, they will not last very long. Routinely, they would be backed by a rotary pump and then either a diffusion pump or a turbo molecular pump. You'll see those on field emission guns that require very, very high vacuum. Can improve the vacuum up to better than deep space. And I get a pump here and one that's been opened here. I'll show the internals. And they are positioned right at the top of the column on those machines that require extremely good vacuum. We might have a look at where they're positioned on the SEM that we have here with us. We have the top iron getter pump and here we have the initial iron getter pump maintaining very, very high vacuum at the top of the column. When the power goes off on an instrument, for example, and we rely on battery backup powers, the only vacuum components out of this hierarchy that are kept on are those iron getter pumps and the whole of the column is sealed off so that we maintain a very high quality vacuum at all times in the SEM. There's two gauges that cover the gamut of vacuum for routine scanning electron microscopy. There's a device called a Pirani gauge and very simplistically can be described as having a resistance wire that loses heat less quickly in a vacuum. So the better quality of the vacuum, the less quickly that resistance wire loses heat and we simply calibrate that, that temperature to the number of gas molecules and we can use it to, to register the quality of vacuum. It measures from air up to about 10 to the minus 2 tor, which is about a roughing pump vacuum. The higher vacuum, higher quality vacuum is registered by a penning gauge, abbreviated PIG, P-I-G. And it's calibrated to measure the amount of ionisation. If we have a better vacuum, we produce less ionisation and we can calibrate the, that uh, to the quality of the vacuum. And it will measure, as we said, 10 to the minus uh, 6 tall or better vacuum. So you will see um, very often both those vacuum gauge levels um, registering. Sometimes you might not see the, the Pirani gauge level. You might just have a light. You might have nothing but basically rest assured those, those two gauges will be operating in the SEM. It's worth noting that the penning gauges have the unfortunate feature of faulting to optimal vacuum quality. So when they're, um, when they're faulting, they, they reveal that they're, they're working perfectly and the vacuum's excellent. So it can take you a little while uh, to sort through vacuum problems sometimes unless you're aware of things like that.